bleeding edge of, of, of quantum mechanics and quantum physics, is that it makes no sense at all to our, our rational worldview. Richard Feynman was one of the world's top particle physicists in the 1980s, and he used to open up his, his lectures with postgraduate students doing particle physics. And he used to say, the things I'm going to teach you now, you will find impossible but you cannot reject them because this is the most successful form of science we have ever known. And yet it's com it is completely counterintuitive in every single sense. I mean, effectively, how can a particle be in two places at the same time? But they are. How come I can take one particle or t two particles, do something called entangle them, then send one particle literally to the other side of the universe, I could, and then do something with the first particle I have in the laboratory, and the other particle would react instantaneously. For instance, uh, around three years ago, I had a meeting with uh, Professor Jeff Forshaw. Now, Jeff Forshaw is the guy that now writes books with Brian Cox. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, Jeff was Brian Cox's PhD tutor. Okay, and Brian Cox being the, the hottest uh, media scientist physicist, broadcaster uh, that we have at the moment in this country. For those who don't know outside the UK, I think they probably even know in places outside the UK, but just to, uh, to clarify yeah, that. Hugely popular guy, used to be a rock musician with a band called D-Ream uh, and used the money he made as a rock star to actually take himself off to do a PhD, I think, in astrophysics. Mm. But effectively, Jeff and I were both invited to do um, a platform event at the National Theatre in London about three years ago. And we were discussing time on the stage at the National Theatre. And Jeff and I met up for a cup of coffee um, a few weeks before just to plan how we were going to approach the, the subject matter. And during over the conversation, Jeff just dropped into the conversation and he said, of course, we know that every electron in the universe knows the location of every other electron. Now, that is incredible. And it's a statement. And Jeff is probably the leading expert in particle physics in this country. And in fact, the new book that he's written with Brian Cox, I think is called How Can an Object Be in Two Places? No, I think everything, it's called Everything That Can Happen Will Happen. And, and if you think about this in terms of the philosophies that we've had down the years and still have, um, if you think about Hinduism, and one of the first things that I remember interviewing a Swami in Bath years and years ago, a guy called Swami Avyaktananda, um, who I think was about 100 years of age then, and was an amazingly wise man. And he said to me, all life, everything is one. Mm. And I have to say, it gave me a headache to think about what he meant. And I had to, as I was going away from the place, really concentrate on the words that he'd said to me in the interview so that I clearly understood what he was getting at. What he was this, telling me is that everything, all things are connected. Very much so. And this is um, in my next book, which actually, funnily enough, I'm putting the finishing touches to today, uh, which will be out next year. Uh, this is exactly one of the subjects I'll be, I'll be discussing because um, somebody I'm working with uh, in, in, in certain ways is a guy called Professor Bernard Haish. And Bernard Haish is a, is a profoundly successful astrophysicist um, over in California. And Bernard is one of the guys that's got a grant from the American government to find ways and or he's working on finding ways and means of drawing up information from something called the zero point field, mm -hmm. which we can touch on later. But Bernard has written an amazing book called The God Theory. And in this, he suggests exactly the same thing. Effectively, we are all one single consciousness. As Bill Hicks, the American comedian, once said, we are all a single consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. In other words, we are, for want of a better word, the Godhead, and we are elements of the Godhead. What we are doing is effectively existing in a three-dimensional holographic recreation or, or creation of the mind. And in this, we are like beings in a soap opera, in the sense that we are not aware of our true selves. Now, again, this is something that has been known as you turn around. The Vedanta has said this for centuries. It's a central premise of Buddhism. It's a central premise of Hinduism. It's also a central premise of most of the Western religions, because if you start looking deeply into the more esoteric regions of Judaism, Islam and Christianity, i.e. into Sufism, into the Kabbalah and into Gnosticism, you will find that this concept is what is generally believed to be the case. It is also the case for most mystical traditions. 
as well. This is one of the great secrets. Now, the thing is, what I'm trying to do is to do the science of this, to show that there, is a, there are scientific ways of showing that this is a strong possibility. And if you think of a pint of water, um, within that pint of water, there'll be millions and millions of little bugs, and they will all be in the water together. They're all separate, but they're united by the fact that they're all in the water. It's that kind of thing, isn't it? You're saying that we are all human beings. We're all in our water, which is the experience of this planet Earth that we have, and we're all interpreting that experience. But nevertheless, it is the same experience. We're all having the same experience, and it's, it's our, our perception of that is what we make of it. I, I'm putting this badly, but life is what we make of it, in other words. But it's all the same thing. Well, effectively, this is this is the great mystery. One of the things that, um, if you there there are, there are various things that you can actually get what I'd call a Newtonian scientist spluttering, and the first one is the thing I touched on before: the observer problem, the way in which the act of observation to, seems to bring about the physical reality we see around us. This is something that was applied. Um, as a try to put down of it by Erwin Schroeder in his famous Schrodinger's cat experiment. It is something that um, Einstein turned around and once said, I cannot believe that the moon isn't there when I don't look at it. But the reality of the fact is that all the empirical research in quantum physics shows that this is in fact the case. Now, if consciousness has a powerful effect upon external reality, this suggests that consciousness is the basis of reality. In other words, consciousness is not an epiphenomenon of matter, but matter is created by consciousness by the act of observation. Now, if this is the case, this puts human consciousness or any form of consciousness at the baseline of the reality we live within. Now, the second issue that um, scientists have profound problem is it's something that Australian philosopher David Chalmers calls the hard problem. And the hard problem is how it is that basic electrical signals in jelly in my brain can create the concept of Howard Hughes or Anthony Peake. Mm. In other words, you and I both have hopes, fears, anticipations, love, hates. We have an inner world that we think about, that we anticipate, everything else. Now, we know we are entities that have an inner life. There is something called eliminative materialism, which is put forward by people like Patricia Churchland and Daniel Dennett and quite a few of the famous neurological scientists who claim, believe it or not, that we're fooling ourselves, that in fact there is nothing going inside, there is no inner life at all. We literally are robots that think we are conscious. In other words, we are being fooled. But my central response to that is, how can you fool something that's not conscious? In other words, you have to be self-reflective to be mm. fooled in the first place. True. You have to be able to come up with the idea that you are being fooled to be fooled. Yeah, exactly. And this is a central premise, whereas these limited materialists genuinely... I mean, for instance, Daniel Dennett wrote a wonderful book. It is a great book called Consciousness Explained. And in this, he argues that even he is not a sentient, reflective being. Who on earth wrote the book? I have no idea. And indeed, who is spending the royalties of that book? I have no idea. <laughs> so in order to make that concept work, you have to deny what is. You have to deny the fact. In order to make his concept work, you have to deny the fact that he's a, a thinking, feeling being. Exactly. You have <laughs> You have to deny the fact, for instance, one of the arguments I use uh, in terms of the, the deeper philosophical aspects of the, the, the material I write about is the word empirical. It's bandied around by scientists continually. We have to empirically prove this. The word empirical means from experience. Now, effectively, everything I experience is processed by my brain and is presented to my consciousness inside my head. What else, I know, what else I can possibly know from my experience except my own experience of it is zero. Everything you are looking at now, everything you are perceiving, for instance, visual, the vis uh, how the visual cortex works. Effectively, everything you're seeing now as you're looking out of your eyes is being created and processed from a small inverted image the size of a postage stamp on the back of your retina. 
That is then turned into electrical stimulus that goes down your optic nerve to the visual cortex of the brain, where it is recreated by the brain and is then sent somewhere whereby the little homunculus in the brain that calls itself I or me suddenly sees it. But the, but the vision you are seeing now is not that little small postage stamp image on the back of the retina, but an all-encompassing three-dimensional wraparound image that you see from your eyes. You know, and the whole thing is a mystery. The question of vision, there's a guy called um, uh, Richard L. Gregory, who's an expert on visual sciences and how the brain processes vision. And it's one of the greatest mysteries, yet it's the most immediate sense we have. And we don't even understand that. And I often think in my more reflective moments, the world that I see and the things that I see, I mean, we know that some people don't perceive colours in the same way as others. I often wonder... Do you see what I'm seeing? How can I know that? How can I know that you see the world as I'm seeing it? That it's the you, same, the, they're the same objects, it's the same, you know, park outside the flat that I live. How can I know that? You can't. You can't know that because you cannot share the, the concepts and perceptions of another human being. And yet not, we are all connected. Yes, and not only that, but you can't even convey it. I turn around to people and I say, OK, explain to me the colour red. You see the color red. You explain to me exactly what you see when you see red. And all you can do is say, well, it's a kind of a reddy color. Well, my red, I might perceive red as green. And of course, in the ultimate physics of it all, red doesn't exist. Red is just a certain vibration of the electromagnetic spectrum that our visual field perceives as this kind of red color. Now, on top of this, this is another great mystery of neurology. It's called qualia. Qualia are those things, the, the intensities of perceptions we have. The idea that red is red is nonsensical. In my first book, I use the analogy of the movie um, Schindler's List. And in Schindler's List, there is a section, the whole movie is in black and white, you may recall, except for one mm. small section where there's a little girl in a red coat. And you see her running down a, a street in, in Poland. Uh, Warsaw or somewhere and then later in the film you see that red coat in a pile of bodies okay terrible powerful uh, way of putting it across by Steven Spielberg but effectively I say to people when you watch that movie on your tv screen from a video where is the red was the red in the coat when it was first filmed was it then superimposed when they redid the film in black and white and put it into color? Is the red in the DVD that you're playing? Is the red in the laser beam that is actually reading the DVD? Is the red in on the screen of your TV as you watch it? Is the red in the retina of your eye? Or is the red in the brain? And the answer is the red is nowhere. The red is just, it's a qualia. It's, it's like pain. If there were no beings, sentient beings in the universe, pain wouldn't exist. Pain is a sensation, but it doesn't exist in three-dimensional reality. Thought does not exist in three-dimensional reality. So the, a big, a big, big thing derives from what you're telling me, and that is using the example of red, but anything really. Red is red because we all believe it is. So you can apply that to just about anything. And if we started to believe differently about anything, then the something that we're believing about or thinking about would become different. In other words, we can create our own reality. It's been said before, it's become a cliche. Maybe this is the proof. We do create our own reality. I think an example of creating our own reality is what happened this morning to me. I, I expect my computer to not work. I particularly expect my computer not to work when we get together. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this morning, I switch on my laptop, and lo and behold, it decides to, to, to load 17 updates. And it, it continued loading the updates till a minute to nine. Then I had to switch it off, and we were due to call at 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the things I use. I call it the photocopier effect. If you're at work and you have a big meeting and you have to get the photocopies done for the meeting, the photocopy will cease to function. This is as if the universe around you is, is picking up your negativity, and you impose that negativity on the world around you. So as somebody's been in my lowest points with this tinnitus problem that I've had this year, uh, which of course has affected something very fundamental to me, and that is my hearing, which I use as a broadcaster. Um, somebody's been trying to explain to me that what you think is what you get 
And if you keep thinking the same thing, you'll get more of it. So exactly. if you think your way out of the problem, magically, you will find your way out of the problem. There are loads of examples in my very small life, but I can remember being a fat teenager at school in Liverpool, and I didn't like it. And I made a, a conscious effort to become a thinner 